Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. The Savvy Painter Podcast is published every week on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, and Google Play. If you are a painter or artist who is looking for down-to-earth, real-life conversations about art, how to create it, how to sell it, you are in the right place. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community, you will be inspired to create, and you'll hear real stories from artists who are thriving with their art. So if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you to the Savvy Painter community. But make sure you don't miss an episode. Sign up for weekly updates, free guides, and workshop announcements. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It's that easy. My guest this week is Melinda Kutsana. Melinda is an artist living in Menlo Park, California. She paints the figure in thick, layered, almost abstract shapes. Her work is inspired by Bay Area figurative artists, though her voice is distinctly her own. In this episode, we talk about how Melinda transitioned from interior design into painting, specifically how she organized her very first open studio. And if Melinda has one piece of advice for artists, it's not to wait too long to put yourself out there. Getting your work in front of collectors and submitting to galleries can be a little intimidating. I think we've all felt that way. So it's natural for artists to want to make sure that the work is good enough. And while creating good work absolutely comes first, artists are prone to falling into a downward spiral where they feel like no matter what, the work is never good enough. Melinda has some words of advice if you've ever felt this way. And some reassurance too, you're not alone. Melinda and I also talk about her new fascination with cold wax and how she's been playing with it in her paintings. We also talk about receiving criticism and how to interpret it when it's particularly harsh. Now, here is Melinda Kutsona. Melinda, thank you so much for being a part of the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm excited to talk with you. Well, thank you for having me, Antrice. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you started out as an artist. Can you tell me, was there sort of a moment when you decided that you were going to be a quote unquote professional artist and that this was the thing that you were going to make your living off of? Well, I started, my background was in interior design. So I went to art school to learn design and graphics. And I've always just had a really uh, passion for all kinds of art. And so I had that background in terms of training, but I always wanted to learn to oil paint. And I never had the opportunity actually in school to take oil painting. I delved into watercolors and all kinds of other things for basically my whole life. I've been painting something. But finally, I kind of had the opportunity to learn that medium. And then I, as far as kind of turning that into the professional side of painting full time and working that way, I kind of tested the waters with open studios and I sold a lot of work through open studios for a number of years and was pretty successful in that. And that's when it kind of really gave me the courage to go, okay, I think I can do this as a full-time fine artist instead of like graphics and interior design. Nice. Do you remember your first open studio and what led up to it and how you were feeling about it? Yes, I, well, more or less. I don't know if I remember exactly <laughs> the first one since I probably did, you know, I don't know, at least a dozen of them. But I, at that point, I had been painting, you know, for a little few years. So I had a little bit of inventory, so to speak. And that at that point, it was mostly like landscapes and still lives and all the kinds of things that you often start with as an, a painter in terms of subject matter. Mm-hmm. And I had, oh, I don't know, probably at least 30 paintings or something. And I just sold them really well. It, it, it's, I feel like that's a really great avenue for artists starting out to kind of test their waters. And as I said, get feedback from the public. Yes. You know, in terms of literal feedback, like I like this and also the feedback of I want to buy it. So yeah, and I was very successful in that and very, I was very fortunate, I feel to, to be successful in that. How did you prepare for that? Or how did you get people to come where? So give me an idea of where that studio was. And is it in a place that's high traffic? So actually, it was at my house. It's where I worked out of my house, out of my garage is basically my studio. 
and still is, even though I, intermittently I had a big studio space somewhere else. I'm kind of back home because I really love working from home. And I am in a place, you know, Silicon Valley is pretty nice in that there's a pretty strong art community here. So open studios in Silicon Valley is very popular and there's a lot of artists who do it. So in that way, and I'm in a very accessible location for people to kind of come by and see. So in that way, that was obviously very helpful. I'm not out in the boonies somewhere, or very rural, where it's hard for people to get to. Right. In terms of preparing for it, it was a mailing list, you know, same old kind of thing that you would think, right? Mm-hmm. You know, sending out to friends, mailing list, also just like postcards and things. That was back when when I started, there wasn't all this social media. So that was like, everything was a postcard, right? Mm-hmm. And so I send, I drop them off at hair salons and libraries and stuff like that to kind of pull people to my location. Nice. And how did it go? In tr- you know, I know you said it was really successful, but I'm always curious when people do it for the very first time, it can sometimes be a little bit intimidating. And, you know, like all these people are coming into your home or into your studio and they're looking at your work. Did that make you nervous? Or were you kind of just like, okay, I'm doing this? No, that's a good question. I'm okay with that. And it it doesn't make me nervous. I'm okay with people looking at my, that was actually kind of jumps to a, a question that you had on your list of questions about, can you describe a single habit that helps contribute to your success? And I think part of what I have is this thing where I can separate criticism of my work from me personally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and it makes it helpful so that when people come by and, and look at a painting and do that, oh, my daughter could do that or, you know, one of those kinds of things. Right. If I have that, it's kind of not about me. It's just about the painting them, Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and their interpretation. So I'm kind of okay with critiques or whatever of my work, but so that was okay. And, and so I would just encourage other artists to have that as much as possible. You know, I, I don't know. I think that's something that sometimes you're born with. That's, that's a skill that's hard to, I think it, you can work on that, but to have that, it's a little bit, it takes some time. Not everybody feels that way is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I I think that, I mean, I think it's absolutely a learnable skill. I think that you can get there through practice and through low risk, you know, what I would consider like low risk scenarios where if somebody's doing this for the first time, they can kind of, and they're really, really nervous about it. They can start by doing just like a very small version of it and then building themselves up to be like, okay, that happened. And it wasn't that big of a deal or just dive in, do it, keep going until that confidence builds up and the uncomfortable part of it wears off. Exactly. And for the most part, I've found that the people that come through open studios are really very supportive and nice and they're not that critical. Most people aren't like that. I also (laughs) always did it. I know. I also always did it with other artists. So that would help pull a larger audience of people to the venue. So I would, I would have like a mosaic artist and a guy I had, there's a woodworker friend or printmaker too, you know, just different people. So there was always two or three other artists here that, um, and that kind of spreads that, you know, everybody's looking at more things. So the focus isn't always so much just on you. Right. Which can be good. Yes. Yes. That's a nice relief sometimes. I want to shift gears a little bit. I'm curious, was there a moment or a decision that you made in your career that you feel was a personal success? That's a hard question for me, but as for me, it's, it would be little things along the way. There wasn't any really big moment. It would Mm -hmm. be little things. I find that's usually what it is. That it's just these like tiny little pivots or tiny little hurdles that you get over. Yeah. One of them I have to say that comes to mind was, I had been in a gallery, my first gallery, for many years, and they're great, and I love them, and they're wonderful people, and I do great there, but I just like, it's time to be in more than one gallery. This was in my head, right? Mm -hmm. And so, that would be like my goal every year, you know, I need to get more than one gallery. I need to get branch out. And then, you know, December would go by and January 1st would come and I still hadn't done it. (laughs) And so, there was one year, like, like about this time of year, you know, it was a number of years ago now. And it was November and I'm like, I, I don't want this to happen again, you know, to be January and I still haven't done it. So I just made myself sit down and call this gallery that I knew might be interesting, you know, like a good fit could work. Mm-hmm. And I, I was like, you know, really nervous, just like you would be. And so I called them up and I, you know, I said, hi, this is Melinda Kutsona. No, I was actually, that's what I felt <laughs> like inside. <laughs> right. The little, the little three-year-old voice that comes yeah, out sometimes. Right. right. 
No, I put on my professional voice and I was like, you know, this is Melinda Katsota. You know, I'm, I'm interested in being in your gallery, you know, and, and kind of before I even got any of that out, they knew who I was Mm. and they said, Oh, we love your work. We'd love to see your work. Please bring it up. And I was like, Oh my God. You know, I mean, it was an ideal answer, right? Anybody would love, any artist would love to hear that on the other end. But that made me feel like, okay, you can do this. And it was like a mini goal of, I should have done it earlier. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, not too much earlier. They wouldn't have known who I was. But it's that, you know, don't wait too long and think you need 60 paintings to show someone, you know, that all have to be perfect. Right. There's a certain point where you really need to start putting yourself out there. And that was that was one of the mini ones of feeling good about myself and professional. Right. And that's, yeah, that's fantastic. And I love that it goes back a little bit to what you said about the open studios and people being nicer than you expect, which it's funny because what's inside of our head is, is kind of like this worst case disaster scenario. Yes. And so we, (laughs) like like the things that we come up with, it's actually really funny. And people People who are going to come into your studio to see your work are coming because they want to see your work and they're interested in art. And, you know, if it's an open studio tour, maybe they don't know you, but they're going around the open studio because they're interested in in art and they're already sort of primed for you to talk to them. It's not like, you know, you're taking your work and shoving it in front of somebody's face who's eating dinner or something, you know, where they're not expecting it. Right, exactly. And I think that the fears that we have often are, they just get amplified the longer that we sit on them. And that story that you just told about the gallery seems to be a perfect example of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't wait too long, I think it's the... (laughs) Is the, it's exactly what you say. You, 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 there's a point where you have to put yourself out there and kind of run with it. And people are a lot more accepting than you think they will be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even within the rejections. I mean, of course, there's the reject. You know, we know we're not looking for new artists or no, but, but it's, it's for the most part, they're nice about it, right? And if they're not nice about it, you don't want to be with them anyway, right? You don't want to work with somebody who's, in, you know, a okay. polite jerk. So. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So when you, I know I'm going to get this question after listening to that response. Do you have any advice for artists who are trying to figure out if they're ready? That is a really good question. Yes. (laughs) It's not, it's not always that easy though. You need to find, in my opinion, you need to find mentors or other artists that you respect that can help you through that. That's, I had some of that in, in my career and, um, and it's can be hard because I have a lot of artist friends, but I don't want their opinion on my art, right? Because it's just not the same as my opinion on my art. But then there's a handful of people that I really respect what they say about my art. or I agree we're on the same plane, so to Mm -hmm. speak. So if you can find somebody like that or more than one person, ideally in a perfect world, that can give you that kind of um, confidence and sometimes guidance or direction, depending, that can be a wonderful thing to help. I mean, to have some kind of community like that is ideal if it's possible. Yeah, that's, yeah, fantastic. That's really good advice. And I'm, I'm going to guess because I know you teach a lot of workshops that you have artists approaching you asking for this or do you? Oh, I do. Yes, I do. I do. But I'm not, I wasn't saying that to promote me. <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but this is a really good question because I think, or this is, a, listen to me, this is a great question. <laughs> um, the question I wanted to ask was, as somebody who gets this, how would you suggest that artists approach somebody that they admire, who they want to sort of mentor them? Are there any, do you have any do's and don'ts for that? Well, I guess the do's would be to approach them depending on where they're located by email or some kind of contact, right? And say that you 
assumably, I, and this is going to sound funny because I don't want people emailing me and saying, oh, Melinda, I love your work. And so that's why I want, want to work with you. But, you know, you establish a connection, why, mm-hmm. why you are contacting them, right? Mm-hmm. So that would be a do. And I guess, again, going back to that, don't wait too long. Don't be too afraid. Don't feel like your work has, yes, your work should be at a certain standard that you feel if you're thinking of going and making it professional and doing this professionally. Yeah, it does need it to be at a certain um, level. But again, if you wait forever, I still think my work can be better, way better than it is. So there's just a certain point where you have to go, look, it's good enough. I've got to try this, right? Yes. So do that, contact the person and see if they're willing to mentor you. I guess the thing in the don'ts, I don't know what that is. I I don't want to put any negative stuff out there because I think kind of per what you referred to earlier, we all have enough negative stuff going on in our heads about, we can create a lot of negativity about our own work and about our own self-worth and all that kind of stuff. So oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> don't worry about the don'ts. Focus on the do's. <laughs> well, yeah. And I think that there's a lot of things that people can do to sort of set themselves up to get a yes. Things like developing a relationship with the person a little bit, at least so it's not out of the blue and they've never heard of you before. They've never interacted with you before. I think that that can be really helpful to know like, oh, okay, yeah, I recognize this person. I know that from my interactions with this person, I have a good idea of who they are and that they would follow through on suggestions or whatever. So I think some things like that are worth doing, which is sort of presenting yourself in a way that's like not out of the blue and also indicates that you you are willing to, quote unquote, do the work or take the advice. That is really actually incredibly important. The latter part of what you're saying, in my opinion. And so I completely agree with you. And that is the doing the work part, because there's a lot, and I have been through this with several mentor students where they think that I am going to hold them accountable for doing the work, which is true to some degree, except they still have to do it. Mm -hmm. And so they think that coming to me or or coming to a mentor is going to hold them accountable. Well, I can only do so much. They still have to do the work. So I can say, do, you know, four paintings in a month like this. But, you know, if the month goes by and nothing's done, I I can't go over there and hold the paintbrush for them, you know. (laughs) So, yes, but showing up is everything, right? It's, Mm -hmm. It's just showing up. Mm hmm. So when you think back on your career so far or your experience as an artist so far, was there ever a point where you encountered a setback or experienced a failure? And what did you take away from that experience? So what I would say to that is in art school, we used to have crits, right? Mm -hmm. So they put up all the work on the wall and, you know, they talk about everybody's work, blah, blah, blah. And in a bunch of them, they would order it. Like I remember they would order it from like the teacher would put the, what he thought was the best one on the right or the left. And, you know, the worst one on the opposite end of the wall and all the way down in between. And I have been on both ends of that wall. And I think just that experience of, it wasn't so much a failure, but being able to know that it's okay to be on both ends of that wall and understand how you got there (laughs) is really, really important. And again, that kind of goes back a little bit to that, still having enough confidence to know it's really not about you, but it's about your work and about improving. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd like to say to that point is what I've heard from so many people in my lifetime in different places and both obviously as being a teacher and instructor, but also just in I remember really well one time I was getting my makeup done at Nordstrom or something, you know, and the the girl was putting on my eyeliner or whatever. And she had told me this experience she had. She wanted to be an artist and she'd been in school and had done some painting and the teacher just tore it apart, so to speak, you know, verbally. And she said, that's it. I never did it again. I don't ever want to pick up a brush again. I'm not going back to it. And that's just so, you know, obviously that's just crushing Mm -hmm. for all of us, I'm sure to hear, but you have no idea how many times I've heard that, how many times I've heard that over and over. And I guess I don't know what that, what I'm trying to say is to learn 
that it's okay to have those failures and you have to go on. You have to create. You can't let that person who was such an idiot to not know how to instruct correctly ruin your life. You have to go past that, but that's about them and not about you. Right, right. I've had some pretty, I remember the school that I went to, the crits could be very, very brutal. And I think learning to pull what you can out of that, even when it's a bad situation to be able to, and it's not easy. So I don't want it to be like, oh, just do this. Right. right. But practicing having that state of mind where you can say, okay, I'm set on this. I'm doing this, meaning I'm doing art is my career. Art is my vocation. And in order for me to get better, I'm just going to pull everything that I can out of every situation. So in those really ugly situations, a lot of times it's really good to just kind of go like, okay, what are the things that I should just flat out discard that are just ridiculous? And is there any truth to any piece of this, even if it hurts? Yes. Yeah. That I can take away with me. And then on the other side, you know, like when you you mentioned that they would line them up in order of left to right or whatever, and from best paintings to worst paintings, sometimes that's really subjective too. Absolutely. And it's kind of like judging competitions or, you know, art competitions. It depends a lot on who the judge is and what type of work they're interested in, what they respond to. The same painting might do really well in a different class or in a different space. And so finding the people who really enjoy your work and really respond to it is also critical. Yeah, absolutely. It's very true. And it was completely subjective because I remember there was a young guy, this was, we were like 19 years old or whatever in, Mm -hmm. you know, early college. And there was some guy had been like that hotshot artist in high school. He'd been like number one top guy. And he was down at the worst end of the wall (laughs) because (laughs) his drawing was too perfect. And this particular instructor wanted more emotion, you know what I mean? And his drawing was too rigid. So yeah. And maybe the lesson was this guy has been getting accolades for, you know, nobody had ever challenged him. And this teacher decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge him a little bit or he was a jerk. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I had, I remember one really bad crit where the paintings were all lined up and the instructor, I'll never forget this. And it still makes me laugh, looked at mine and he turned around and he just looked at me like it was just absolute disgust. And he turns back and he looks at the painting and he just shakes his head, picks the painting up and turns it. So it's facing the wall. Oh my gosh. And said, I'm not even going to talk about this one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh my. and, you know, of course, at the time, 19 year old Antrees was completely devastated. But at the same time, you know, like when I had a little bit of time to ride the emotions out and let them go, you know, like a couple days later, a week later, I was like, yeah, you know, I really kind of dialed that one in. I tried to pull it off at the last minute. I didn't put the amount of work in that he had requested us. And yeah, it was not a good painting. So regardless of, you know, how he did it, the lesson really for me was, you know, don't turn in crap. Yeah. Yeah. And I think all this just speaks to, you have to be on some level able to deal with this Mm -hmm. as an artist, as a professional artist, Mm -hmm. this good behavior and bad behavior. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't want to give the impression by saying that, that, you know, we should be robotic about it. I, of course, felt really upset. And I was, as a 19 year old, I probably went home and cried. I don't remember now, but you know, like I had all of the emotions that you would expect with that. And I let them ride themselves out. But then at a certain point, you have to kind of look at things objectively and go, okay, what can I take away from this? So that the lesson isn't don't ever paint again, or the lesson isn't that person is horrible. What is the thing that you can take out of this that you can move forward with? And even more importantly, just keep going. Yeah. I think it's just, even if you don't take anything out of it, even if you hated it and it was horror, you know, and you just, whatever, just keep going. Yeah. Keep doing it. Yeah. Then the lesson is you can fall down and get right back up. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. With scraped knees and a little bit of a bruised ego, but you know. (laughs) Yeah. But a great story to tell. Exactly. (laughs) Down the road. (laughs) Eventually, everything becomes funny if you let it. (laughs) So I would love to hear about what goes on in your studio. Can you tell me about what you're working on right now? 
Well, I am working on using cold wax with the oil. Oh, I love it. And that is my kind of current focus. And there's so much to do and learn with this, for me, new medium. It's actually been around forever, but it's kind of become popular recently, right? And I'm just exploring with it and trying to figure out what it does in all kinds of different ways. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like I'm even close to figuring it out yet, (laughs) which is good. That's a really good thing, you know? It's exciting. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It brings definitely a whole new element into the studio work. What is it about cold wax that excites you? Okay, so it's you add it to oil paint. And one thing it does is it helps speed up the drawing time. So I can do my layering in my work a little bit faster. And you can go back to it. You can scrape back into it. You can create all kinds of really interesting textural work. So it becomes even starts to become a little bit three-dimensional that way. Mm -hmm. It can act somewhat like encaustic in that encaustic is when you use wax. I'm just saying this for listeners Mm -hmm. that may not know because you probably know. I love it when you do that. I love (laughs) it when people do that. So go for it. (laughs) Encaustic, you use heat to fuse the layer. So you have to, it's a much more technical kind of process. It's wonderful. I love it, but I'm just paranoid. I'm going to light my studio on fire because I'm just too disorganized and I'm going to put down a torch and that'll be it right next to the paper towels. <laughs> but you get, uh, can you can get kind of a, with encaustic work, you get a depth, like you're looking through these layers of wax, which can be amazing. And you can actually get some of that same kind of effect using the cold wax with, and there's no heat with cold wax. So you don't have to worry about lighting your studio on fire. So, so I, I love that looking through with the, the wax and going back. And I do now some paintings where I paint the figures on the board and then I completely cover them up and then I pull back to them by using turpentines and, or, you know, odorless mineral spirits and pulling the paint back off and then doing it again over and over and over. And you get this depth of figures coming through space stuff happening. So I don't know. I'm just having a lot of fun with it. It sounds like so much fun. I'm just sitting here going like, oh, I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the other thing I've discovered with it, and I would so encourage people to do this, this is like the easiest thing in the world to say and the hardest thing in the world to do. And that is, so my best paintings, probably forever, but I mean, I've certainly really recognized it recently, are when I am just messing around with a panel, you know, or canvas, Mm -hmm. trying to figure something out. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to figure something out. It has nothing to do with creating a painting. I'm just like, okay, how does this coax stuff work? I'm going to try this. I'm going to do that. Blah, blah, blah. You know, let's put this on here. Let's wipe it away. Let's do this. This has nothing to do with creating a painting to go into a gallery or anything. And at the end, it's like, oh my God, that's like the best painting. Yes. Because I had nothing, right? It's like, how did that even happen? I don't know how it happened. It was just experiment. So I have this big thing in my head now that every painting needs to stay in that space of just experimenting and not doing anything, just play with it. But it's so hard. (laughs) Yeah, it's hard because then you want to, I think we go in and we try to control things and we want to make it look quote unquote good. I'm using air quotes. But I think when you leave things open and don't make decisions quickly, this is probably the only time I think, you know, when you're being creative is when you allowing that sort of indecision to happen and to play with things and and allow for surprises. I find that when I'm painting and I'm, and I'm not set on precisely where the line is, I just know the general area and, you know, I leave things really loose and do a lot of lost and found, which sounds like what you're talking about. It is so much more fun and it's things happen that you could never plan. Absolutely. And you kind of alluded to something in what you just said there of, I have a big thing when I teach and again, try to do my own work to let it be kind of chaotic and Mm -hmm. wrong and not okay for as long as possible Mm -hmm. to, to be okay. As I say, be okay with that chaos because it's a richer painting. If you can work through something than if you just go, if I just go and paint a figure and it's all pretty and it looks really good and blah, 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 you know, and it takes me two days 
it's boring. It just doesn't have the history in it. It doesn't have something to it. But if you can live with it, the struggle, that's what comes through in a really good painting. I agree. Yeah. It's like you, there needs to be surprises. There needs to be discovery. There needs, it's like if you read a book where they described everything in just minute detail, well, number one, you just like stop reading the book. (laughs) I mean, I, I guess I'm just imagining if, you know, if an author is trying to set the scene and they go into this immense detail on the desk and yet that desk is not relevant at all to the story or what's about to happen, you're focused so much on this desk because he's telling you to focus there and you're thinking this is really important and then it has no relevance. And so I think in paintings, when everything has equal importance and everything is perfectly explained, then you don't give the viewer anything to do. Exactly. Yeah. It's boring. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's yeah. kind of sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You want, you want to come back and discover something as much as you can every time you look at a piece, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you start a painting? Can you talk about your process? I start, I always have information on the canvas. I never start really painting a figure on a blank canvas. You know, never say never. There's always exceptions, but for the most part, never. 99% of the time. So I always have layers of some kind of paint, ideally sometimes wax or just, I I call them my graffiti marks. Mm -hmm. Just have, I basically paint in an ideal situation. I have like five layers of abstract paintings on a painting before I put a figure on there. That's just to build up history and colors and texture and gives me something to work with when I actually start putting the figure on. Interesting. And do you work on multiple paintings at a time or? Always. Number one recommendation to any artist is have at least four or five paintings going on at a time. I would say that's my number one thing that I tell every student, especially with oil paint because of the drawing time and how Mm -hmm. you have to go through that. But even with acrylics, because otherwise people get too focused. You get too focused on, oh my God, this one has to be done and it has to be perfect and they can't see. They don't know what they're looking at. You have to like look away, turn that painting to the wall or walk away and work on something else. And, And then that other painting will give you the answer to the other one and Yeah, I always have multiple. And the worst scenario, the worst scenario is when I have like four paintings and they're kind of all at the same stage and they're almost done. Because then (laughs) I have to start off. So I will actually stop and not finish them. Yeah. And then I'll start going and building up a bunch of other canvases to get them to a place so that I know that once these other four are done, I can hop over here and, and, and I won't be starting completely brand new. Do you have a preferred size that you like to work at? I kind of like, I've been working on these canvases that are about, it's a weird size. It's like 36 by 33 oh, or something like that. Really? Yeah, they're off there. I don't, I like squares and I like just off square. Pretty much most of my, unless they're squares, my canvases are all custom made because I don't buy normal size canvases because I like them just a little off square. Why is that? Compositionally, it makes a better composition. It's easier to create a good composition for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like things that are too landscape oriented or vertical oriented. So I I, I tend to like squares, but I also like them when they're not quite square. (laughs) I I have some that are too, they're like 46 by 42, something like that. For me, it's much easier to paint larger than small. Small paintings are hard for me. Why is that? I think you get to, I would rather paint with my shoulder than my wrist, Mm -hmm. you know, just kind of. You get too detailed and then get too into the small and it's okay. I mean, when I do them successfully, I'm very happy with them, but they're there. And also it takes me literally probably takes me as long to do a small canvas as it does to do a big. Isn't that true? Yeah. So then I'm thinking of, you know, that multiplies out dollar wise. It's like, (laughs) (laughs) and it's just hard to sell a small one. It is a big one. So, you know, I don't know. Oh, I love it. That's funny. And it's, it's so true because it's, I, even though I know that's true, I will still sometimes go, I'm just going to do this little painting because I want to do something faster. And it's every single time I'm like, why did I do that? Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's like three weeks later. Yeah. Yeah. It was <laughs> not. 
<laughs> yeah, if I go out on site, then yeah, I can whip them out in like an hour or two. But if I'm in my studio, it it just always ends up being the same. It's so funny. Or I'll paint over it like at five or six or seven times. Yeah, exactly. Same here. Do you have a ritual or habit that you kind of start your day off with? I'm always curious what what the patterns are when an artist walks into their studio. What do you do? I, well, I do the, what I shouldn't do, and that is check my email and Facebook and everything <laughs> else. But that's partly because of the teaching side of my life that I mm-hmm. kind of have to make sure everything's under control over there. But I need to learn to be a little more disciplined with that time frame. And then I, well, actually, this is kind of funny because I think people might relate to it. Once I kind of, st- I have usually several canvases around my studio. I paint on the wall, so they're all hung around on the wall. And I start looking at them and deciding which one I'm going to work on. And I thought about this the other day because because pretty much the thought process is, so right when I'm going to get into them and you know start laying out paint and everything, the first thing that goes through my head is, am I hungry? <laughs> 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 and then the next thing is, is yeah, I think I need some more hot water or tea. <laughs> I do and, exactly the same thing. That's so funny. And then it's like, okay, wait a minute. I need some music. Oh God, what music am I going to listen to? <laughs> <laughs> and and is it going to be on Pandora or Spotify or you know Amazon? <laughs> it's like it's the nature of the brain. I think to it's like a clearing house of all the things to get out of the way before you focus on painting, you know? And because as I say, there's absolutely positively always a reason not to paint. Yes. Okay. So that's what I was going to ask is if you think that all those little things like, oops, coffee's not hot enough or, oh, I need to make tea. Oh, not that song. I need a different playlist. If all of those little bees in your head are actually just forms of procrastination. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. And then you can get bigger, right? Does the laundry need to be done? Does the Mm -hmm. dog need to be walked? Do I need to get groceries for dinner? You know, (laughs) then it just spills out into everything else. So it's, it's this, yes, you get all that out of your head. Make sure you have your tea right there. (laughs) Go use the restroom if you need to, but, (laughs) but you need to just, you know, start painting. You need to show up and, you know, start doing something. So that's sort of my ritual if there is one. <laughs> I just love it. I think it's so funny because we all sort of have to be parents to ourselves. You know, yeah. it's kind of like, have you gone to the bathroom yet? Or do you have yeah. enough to drink? Are you okay now? All right, let's go. Yeah, exactly. It's a perfect way of putting it. It's so funny. So you mentioned the music. I like to ask about this. Does the choice of music affect how you paint? Or do you pick different music for different stages of the painting? Yes, actually, all of the above. I like jazz a lot. So I'll have jazz on. And then just I also like stuff that's pop and things. I'm not like a hard rock person. Or So what I found as I've gotten, I don't know if it's older or but I guess more serious about my work, is I always used the music used to be really, really important. And mm-hmm. it is kind of as a starting point, I like to have something in the background. But then what I find is when I'm painting, so what was happening, like when we had CDs and things like that, now it's just kind of non ending stream, right? Mm-hmm. Is that I would paint and that stuff would be on and then I'd be painting, painting, painting. And then all of a sudden I'd realize, oh my God, nothing's been on for two hours because that's a great place to be. Yeah, the voices in my head or whatever else is going. So that's kind of still now what happens is I'd like to have the music on just as a starting point, but eventually I'm not paying any attention to it unless now it's like some annoying song comes on. Mm-hmm. Like Alexa next, you know, <laughs> <laughs> she's probably going to come on now and talk to me. But, yeah, <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Hi, Melinda. What can I play for you? Yeah, she just did that. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, I found that certain types of music absolutely affect how I paint. It's really interesting. Sometimes I need to have classical music on. Sometimes when I feel like I need to, maybe this is just me, but jazz I think is really good because it's long form. And a lot of times there's a lot of improvisation. Improv? (laughs) Improvisation. All of a sudden, I cannot speak English. In jazz, there's a lot of improv. And that helps. I feel like that really helps my creative side of the brain. When I need to be really detailed, I can't listen to jazz. Interesting. Interesting. It's weird. 
Yeah. Well, and and I'm with you sometimes on that, like the classical or the jazz or like for me, sometimes it's lyrics or no lyrics. Like sometimes Mm -hmm. I just can't have words going on in my head. Yeah. So that could be part of some of that too. Yeah. And then if I have too many little squirrels running around in my head, then I need lyrics or I need an audiobook or I need something that's going to like take that part of my brain and say, hey, you pay attention to this. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing happening behind this curtain. You just go over there while I do my painting. (laughs) (laughs) It's really, it's so strange how the creative mind works. So those questions always fascinate me. So you already sort of answered the single habit that contributes to your success. But I'd also love to hear what advice you would give to yourself, the artist that you were 10 years ago. So figure sometime around 2007, if you can think back what you were doing then. I think that that kind of goes to actually the thing that I've already talked about a little bit was don't wait too long. A lot of artists ask me, so, you know, how many paintings should I have before I approach gallery or something like that? So, Mm -hmm. yes, you probably should have maybe 10 good paintings, but with the knowledge that you can continue to create work of that level going forward, right? But you don't have to have 20, you know, you don't have to have, there's just a certain point where I guess I'll answer it this way too. And that another thing that I think contributes to my success, so to speak, is that I have this feeling that what I do is never enough. I always have this feeling Mm. that I'm never painting enough. I'm never getting enough work done. I just, it drives me crazy. I never think that I am getting enough done. Mm -hmm. So that spurs me to do more, right? So Mm -hmm. I think that that's, I think that in a way that's a good, it's very frustrating, but it's a good thing. But I think we can fall into that trap of it's never good enough. I never have enough work. I can't approach a gallery. I can't be a professional. I can't put my work out there to sell because it's not good enough because I don't have enough. But it's a loop. Mm-hmm. So what I would say is to probably try to break through that sooner than later because you're just, I think a lot of people wait too long. Yeah, that's really, really true because there's so much, there's so much to do. And when you get kind of like creatively on fire and you know, like you have this vision and you want it done as quickly as possible, but there's not enough hours in the day to do it. Yes. There's that. Yeah. And, and then the long vision of, I guess one of my big, no, this is no surprise, but one of my big influences is Richard Diebenkorn. And one of the reasons why is not only his work that I love, but it's because he was so flippin' prolific. Mm -hmm. You just look at the body of work that he created and it's mind blowing. I mean, and so I look at that as like, how can I ever do that? I mean, I don't know how, I mean, he started really young and he just was a full-time artist from then on kind of basically is how he did it. But I still don't know how he did it. It, It's just the numerous drawings and drawings and paintings and how he would change from one genre to another. And it's just inspirational and nerve wracking. <laughs> it <laughs> <You> know, is. <laughs> it's like, how can I? And I sit, you know, sometimes I'm like, I should pull out sheets of paper and be doing gouaches, you know, 20 of them today. Or I don't know, <laughs> which of course I don't do. Right. But it, anyway, that's, it's kind of, I think that's in the back of my head as artists like that who just seem to be able to generate this incredible volumes of work. And not only that, his in his particular case like everything he touched was gold so they were all really good yeah that's yeah i know sorry (laughs) right exactly (sighs) well i mean they were all really so it is he oh this is so fascinating to me because there's this spiral that can happen there's sort of the upward spiral or a downward spiral so if you get into those dark moments where you think somebody makes a comment or your inner critic or you yourself are beating yourself up and you just start to spiral down into like, I'm a horrible painter and everything is wrong and you know, blah, blah, blah. And then there's the spiral up when you're just like, no matter what, you're just doing the work. And sometimes if you don't feel like it, then yeah, just put a timer on and say, I'm going to do 20 gouache paintings and, you know, in two hours or whatever it is, you know, just put a ridiculous time setting on yourself so that you can't stop and you can't overthink it, you know, and sometimes that allows for those breakthroughs. And I think with Diebenkorn, what's interesting is, yeah, very, very prolific. I think that that builds on top of each other. It's sort of the upward spiral thing that 
once you start that momentum, once you start that kind of flywheel going, it just starts going faster and faster and faster. And somehow if we can just stop getting in our own way, (laughs) and I'm sure he had those moments too, then our own flywheel starts to go. But I think kind of speaking for myself, I'll stop it a lot. I'll just be like, Oh, no. Yes. Well, yeah, no, I really want to speak to both those points because I think they're so, so important. And the first one being the downward spiral. I think so many artists don't realize that every single artist has those moments of self-doubt. Yes. So they think that once we see, it's even hard for me to think that I'm a successful artist, even though everybody tells me I am, because because of that, I still don't feel good enough thing yet. But anyway, I can tell you that every single person I know and all the artists I know who I think are amazingly successful and sell multi-thousand dollar paintings and stuff, they talk about yeah, that horrible, like, oh my God, I, I suck. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, it's even worth it. Why am I even bothering with this? You know, we all have those moments. And I've talked to so many artists, they're like, really? You have that too? I'm like, uh-huh, <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Everybody. Like, Stop looking at the internet and at how good everybody else is because that'll flip that switch really fast. So that, and then the only way through the second thing on the spiral up is the only way to the work is through the work, really. In yeah. other words, when you sit in your studio and you don't know what to paint or, you know, subject matter, you know, you just don't know what to work on. The only way to figure it out is to do something. Mm -hmm. You have to do something. And then the more you do, the more you will generate those ideas. And it's through the work that you find the work. So that's the upward spiral. I like thinking about them as the two spirals. I'm going to use that now. That's, that's really good entries. (laughs) Good. <laughs> that's very true. Yeah, I think it, I think it's really helpful in that the whole you know sort of domino effect of allowing things to build on top of each other, you know, in a good way. Absolutely. So, last question. Um, I love this because it introduces so many interesting artists. A lot of times, if you could own a piece of art by any living artist, what would it be, or whose? Okay, I thought about that. And I'm going to be one of those people who can't do just one. (laughs) It's a cruel question. I don't think anyone could do just one. Right, right. And I don't think anyone has. Yeah, I guess not. Just so you feel better. So, and I really thought about this because my obvious right off the bat gut reaction answer is Alex Konevsky. But I'm like, everybody knows, you know, Mm -hmm. everybody wants a painting of his. (laughs) If he gave a painting to all of us, you know, or so to speak, (laughs) you could all get one. He wouldn't have any left, right? (laughs) And it's because of his obvious virtuosity and he's amazing. But there's another living painter that I really love. I mean, there's more than one, but Christopher Brown. And he's an artist that actually lives in the Bay Area, as far as I know. I think he's in the East Bay. And he does figurative work, and he, he does really beautiful paintings. And he has a particular painting, so I'm going to pick one. I thought, okay, well, I actually want a specific painting. Ooh, of I love it. <laughs> and it's called 1946. And it's actually here at Stanford in the museum at Stanford in the uh, Anderson Collection. And it's one of my very, very favorite paintings ever. And I loved it kind of before I even knew, before I started oil painting, before I knew about anything. And now it's lucky enough to be right here in the museum. I can go see it anytime I want. So it's almost like having it. Not quite. <laughs> and sharing <laughs> but, it, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. I love that. <laughs> what is it about that painting that, that you respond so strongly to? It's a figurative painting and it is people walking on a street and it has just, it has everything that we've talked about in terms of being, I guess the way to say it is complete, but not finished. Mm-hmm. So there's a definite sense of mystery to it, but you have a sense of being there. It has a really unique perspective. You're sort of partially looking down at the people, but also kind of looking up at them. It's just a masterwork. Beautiful. It has that right balance of mystery and not literalism, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Reality. Yeah. And you were about to say one other person before I interrupted you with that question. No, sorry. Manuel Neri, who's a sculptor. He's was one of the, or is, he's still alive. He's quite old now. Uh, Bay Area figurative artists considered, but he, most of his work, not all of it, but a lot of his work was three-dimensional. And it would be really cool to have a piece of his. Oh, yeah. Very cool. 
Well, Melinda, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. I've been wanting to talk to you for a while. Oh, well, thank you. And it's always so wonderful that you do these. I know everybody gets a lot out of them and it's a wonderful service that you do these on trees. A big thank you goes out to Melinda Kutsona for sharing her time with us and sharing so much of what she's learned throughout the years of painting. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast tab. You'll find show notes there for Melinda's episode where you can see examples of her work, get links to connect with her and find all of the resources that we talked about in this episode. And if you know another artist who needs some information on their first open studio or who you think Melinda's advice will benefit, please share this episode with them. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening.